happy Aloha Friday. This is your host, Beatrice Gentomo. On today's episode of Perspectives on Global Justice, guest Jojo Pita will be sharing with our viewers his many memories from his autobiography, Coconut Rats and Kung Fu Cowboys, written with the retired Professor James Coach. Jojo is a Micronesian national who grew up in Ital, uh, an atoll on the outer Mortlock Islands of Chuuk State in the Faroe States of Micronesia. Jojo is a UH Mano alumni who earned his PhD in special education. In his autobiography, he shares exquisite memories of what life was like growing up on an atoll of 500 inhabitants in all of the enchanted experiences that reveals many nuances of living an authentic life as a male Pacific Islander and as a Soviet leader. In high school, Jojo had an accident which caused him severe spinal cord injury, which resulted in quadriplegia. Jojo's stories features not only his functional ability, experiences, but also gives us a unique insight on Pacific Islander cultures which are filled with courage, resilience, self-determination, gratitude, hardships, love, and many lessons learned along the way. And I hope that uh, this show will leave our viewers not only with um, you know, rooting for Jojo to write a new book in the very near future, but also with valuable insights on how important storytelling is, storytelling is for the preservation, dissemination, understanding and value of Chukis language, Micronesian culture, identity and pride, and how much intergenerational wisdom and sharing of these memories play a crucial role in this process. On that note, welcome Jojo. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bea. You're welcome. I can't uh, imagine, you know, who I would love, love to have time with today and have this uh, very important uh, conversation. Okay. So, wow, you know, about a year ago, you were in the hospital, <laughs> one of your many visits in the hospital. <laughs> like, you were there for what, three months? Yes. And that I was... I had surgery and uh, it took about three months to get everything oh, wow. squared away. Yeah. That was like towards the end of my uh, uh, <clears throat> PhD program, so it only pushed the graduation date a uh, semester back, but, you know, it was kind of needed, and uh, it gave me a sort of a, all the time to think about a lot of things, so I decided, well, maybe it's a good time to write a book now. Right. So at that time, you know, we were just kind of like working on the you know, sketch. And yeah, your book. And, yeah. I was in the middle of fin finishing up the dissertation while I was in the hospital. Right. Also decided to start working on the book. And uh, I had a lot of times in my hand. And uh, so, yeah, it was a lot of, uh, you know. So I wanted to bring you and our viewers back to 1964, the year where Jojo was born. Yes. Now, because I think I butched the name of your island, help me again, it's Ital? Okay, it's okay. Etal. Etal. Yeah, E-T-T-A-L. Etal. Etal. Uh, and, and it's in the Mordlock Islands, and right. the Mordlock Islands, Islands the other island region, is uh, about 160 miles uh, southeast of the main, uh, main lagoon of the Chuuk State. Um, Federated States of Micronesia. So, 500 inhabitants. At the time, yeah, the on time. and off, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think uh, before uh, there was, uh, you know, that that much, I think there were that many people on the islands. And I think uh, recently and now, the, because of our migration, the number has drastically uh, reduced uh, about a half. So or even more than, more than even that. even less yeah, than less that. Than that yeah. And we'll touch base on that a little bit. So, but at that time, I mean, you were one of the few children that were born that year on the yep. island. And you grew up with these kids as you were very close with friends. Yeah. Like all small islands, um, <clears throat> there were only a few of us who were... Uh, and I know, like, the, us boys, there were only three. Three boys who were born in that, age, in that and year. five girls, from what I recall yeah, from the yeah. book, yeah. So usually what we call our, uh, our group, our... Uh, group of friends that we hang out together, we're like a year older or two and then mm -hmm. two years younger. Right. 
that's kind of age group that we kind of like hang out. A little bit older than that, and they're too young, they're too old to hang out with us. We were kind of too young for them, and then the young ones, we just don't want to. So you know. The reason I'm bringing this up, uh, I mean, one is to give our viewers context of where you were born eh? mm -hmm. and also to help us anchor the life, you know, of your life, childhood, eh? yeah. and, you know, before the accident and after the accident. So, mm -hmm. um, and I'm sure that as you were in the hospital, you relived many of these memories. But, uh, you know, for our viewers to get a little teaser of you know, your, your autobiography. Tell us um, what you remember, the highlights of your childhood, uh, you know, mm. growing up in such a neat tight community and mm. bring to us the importance of your grandparents in your upbringing yeah. and of storytelling mm. and also of the church. Because mm. these were very three strong yeah. pillars in your formative years? Yeah. I think uh, <clears throat> the book, the way we structure the book, and I'm really grateful to, to my friend, Dr. Jim Skaggy, who's a retired professor and uh, he was a good friend of mine, uh, is that, you know, we were able to talk about these stories together. Right. You know, it, you know sometimes you don't, I don't really quite, uh, uh, you know, I can tell the stories, and in my mind, I know what the stories are, and I know how they, you know, how they affected me. Mm -hmm. But in order for me to present this to the audience and people who, and we'll talk a little bit about that, but who the target audience is. But in order for me to make sure that um, I, I'm comfortable with what I perceive as um, being useful for the audience. You know, Jim and I spent a lot of time, you know, drinking coffee, talk story at the ZBBs of Nuanu all the time. And we just talk story, talk about these stories. And, and we, talk, you know, talk about them so much, you know, we laugh and we, you know, we feel bad. And we, you know, we just got, you know, shocked sometimes about the stories. But I think it's an important thing, it's for, especially for me, because it's my first book that I was not really comfortable about writing the book. Uh, you know, I'm, I mean, we, we wrote the book together and I have a lot of hand in, 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 in there. But what was important is that we, we talk about it. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, it's sort of a process. Right. You process it before you put it down and then feel comfortable about it. And, mm -hmm. and still, I don't, there are many times when I still don't feel comfortable about the book because I feel like it's, you know, I, it's, you know I'm not really sure how people will, will take it. But anyways, going back to your, uh, your, your point about those pillars of, uh, you know, influences in my childhood, storytelling definitely is a main part of it. And so every small islander growing up uh, uh, in, that, in that environment is surrounded by storytellers. Right. Whether it be your friend who tells you all kinds of nonsense you know, or your grandparents who tell you these very important stories, mm -hmm. or uh, or the you know the older men who tell you legends and who teach you about the legends and things like that. So there's a lot of storytelling uh, going on around you as a young child, mm -hmm. and also the church. What you learn from the church is also very important mm -hmm. because uh, aside from the rituals and you know the the worshiping. You, you, you encounter a lot of stories of the church and what the church is about and, you know, those important, uh, you know, uh, individuals and concepts uh, within the church. So you have those storytelling and then your grandparents, you know, the role of your, the ones who are the closest to you. Like me, uh, I, I was born, I was born, I mean, I was raised by my grandparents because... Mm -hmm. I was the oldest son, and then my grandfather was going blind at some point during my childhood. So my parents made the decision that I would go and live with them. You know, we were a little bit, uh, we were at a, a homestead a little bit further away from everyone, where my dad, granddad, you know, prefers to, you know, to, to live. He doesn't like too many people around him right. too much. 
I've had really great fishermen, and he tells us a lot of, uh, you know, so, stories. Um, I, as I was reading uh, the first part of your book, I got transported to this very idyllic, you know, um, almost fantasy-like uh, narrative uh, of, uh, you know, clear water, a lot of abundance in terms of the land being able to provide and sustain people's basic needs. Uh, so like your grandparents had a state where a lot of the food was produced uh, and consumed that way. Mm -hmm. There is a clear distinction between like before it had more of an American influence, uh, you know, and, 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 you know, and then after and it seems like it was quite reflected in the day-to-day -day living. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, like, for example, I think for some people, the idea of growing up without electricity is horrifying. But the way that you described it, you know, it seems like it was not a big deal. And, you know, the night it was reserved for very special things, those storytellings mm -hmm. and looking at the stars. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, you, you were born in that environment, and you know, for for us, you know, that was the the way things are. That's the way of the world, mm -hmm. and we we didn't feel any any less uh, blessed or inferior to mm -hmm. that. We didn't have any other things because, um, like you said, when it's dark, it's dark. We will go to sleep, and the stars come out, and and you interact with a lot of friends and. And you know, playing games and t talking stories, and you know, telling stories, and uh, you know, and uh, you know, you, you appreciate a lot about uh, the skies and what you can learn from them, right. the environment, and uh, how it behaves differently at night. Uh, and you, you have also a sense of respect for, mm -hmm. you know, nature that way, because uh, you know, we say when it's dark, there are different realm you know takes place you know interaction with uh, you know people say this ghost comes out and come out at night mm -hmm. or spirit come out at night and uh, you know and you to respect it as it is uh, mm -hmm. during the day you wake up and you go about doing your life and mm -hmm. and that deal about electricity i don't think uh, we really i never really saw electricity mm -hmm. I mean, encounter a life with electricity until I went to high school. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so life really was, um, you know, normal and grand and beautiful. And you got to spend a lot of time with your grandparents and with your grandfather. You both had a very special relationship. He taught you a lot of things, fishing and taking care of the mm -hmm. site. Uh, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Uh, uh, he was, uh, there are two paramount chiefs on the island, and he was one of them. Uh, you know, he's responsible for, you know, guardian, uh, he's sort of the guardian of the land mm -hmm. and the ocean and uh, all that there is within our environment. So people come to him for, you know, advice and disputes, and he has a, you know, special role on the island. So I also, Growing up next to him, I mean, by his side, you know, I, I have a lot of uh, uh, appreciation for the role that he played with uh, in the island, in the island. And, and of course, I would lead him because he was blind. I was also his guide. Uh, I would take him to where he needs to go. He needed to go. And whether it's a meeting with fellow chiefs or you have to go to island celebration and island meetings and you would give like long, the last speech or the long speech for everyone and uh, uh, just being with him uh, taught me in you know mostly now in retrospect when I'm much older a lot of uh, you know patience and uh, he doesn't talk he, he never did talk much uh, he didn't go around, but he just stayed where, you know, where we live. And he went fishing a lot. We, we had to go fishing a lot because he was uh, still a avid fisherman, even when he was completely blind. But he could still, he can, using the movement of the canoe, 
and the uh, feel of the wind because along the island along the lagoon there are smaller islands mm -hmm. so when we go by in different islands and you can feel the, the wind, you know and the wind and, and he would tell me where to paddle and you know i was very intrigued and you know very amazed that uh, uh how well he was able to uh, use the you know the skills of uh, hearing you know, yeah perception. hearing and wayfinding we need to take one minute yeah. break we'll be right back okay okay aloha i'm yukari kuniswe the host of konnichiwa hawaii japanese talk show on think tech hawaii konnichiwa hawaii is all japanese broadcast show and it's streamed live on think tech at 2 p.m every other monday Thank you so much for watching our show. We look forward to seeing you then. I'm Yukari Kunisue. Mahalo. Aloha and mabuhai. My name is Emmy Ortega Anderson, inviting you to join us every Tuesday here on Pinoy Power Hawaii with Think Tech Hawaii. We come to your home at 12 noon every Tuesday. We invite you to uh, listen, watch, uh, for our mission of empowerment, we aim to enrich, enlighten, educate, entertain, and we hope to empower. Again, maraming salamat po, mabuhay, and aloha. Welcome back to Perspectives on Global Justice, Think Tech Hawaii. This is your host, Beatrice Contemo, and we're back with Jojo Pida. So Jojo, um, who did you write this book when you had this yeah. conception? Was that well, you? yeah, it would appear that I'm writing it for myself, which I did. Uh -huh. uh, in that time when I was in the hospital and I had to do something with you know, kind of like uh, thinking back about a lot of where I have been in my life. and But more importantly, I think I, I wrote the book for my nieces and my nephews and uh, the generation of our people that uh, is born and raised outside of our island. Uh, and many other islanders who have similar experience uh, mm -hmm. to reflect on childhood, you know, and back home in the island right. to get a sense of uh, connecting, reconnecting back to, to the islands and get a, uh, an idea what it was like maybe uh, growing up as a small, as a young, uh, young boy uh, around their age now. Uh, right. Right. So I've given copies of the book to my nieces and my nephews and and uh, I, I hope uh, that it doesn't make a lot, any sense to them. Uh, a lot of people have also, you know, uh, read the book and said that it does touch a little bit about uh, what they remember about, you know, at home. Right. Um, <clears throat> I really feel a sense of, uh, you know, my generation that uh, has sort of uh, taken on this odd migration. We're the first generation that left the island. And uh, I feel a sense of responsibility here that I have to, to uh, educate and kind of inform uh, the generation that we have uh, brought, uh, you know, we have brought, you know, them into this world. Right. Uh, well, in many ways, I think that, the, would you call it like a, um, you were the first generation of the Micronesian diaspora, but yeah. not necessarily because you all wanted to leave uh, the islands, but you really didn't have a choice. Mm. But no access to education and health. Uh, mm. and, you know, I think... Um, you know, a lot of people don't understand that, you know, like, yes, on the one hand, uh, um, you know, all of these things happened, but people don't understand why, you know, mm. there had to be a, a departure. Mm. And, uh, I, you know, one part of your book that really uh, struck me, and I will call it that, like, the 
what we call it in America, the grass always look, looks greener on the other mm. side of the fence. Well, when you were a child, you described that um, people who um, came to Hawaii and spoke about mm. the aloha, you know, the image of uh, mm. spokers, girls, and mm. skyscra skyscrapers, you know, and mm. um, navy ships and uh, a complete different uh, picture from, you know, what you were dealing with at home. But then there's also the reality of when um, the recently arrived Kofa resident encounters what you call the, the urban, urban poverty. So do you want to talk a little bit about that? Uh, actually, yeah, this, this is the first of three books that we wanted to work on. And we brought this book up to the point where I graduated from high school. Mm -hmm. Because another thing that is also inherent in this story is, of course, the story of disability, as I am faced and have mm -hmm. and a significant with, of the, uh, the set of disabilities. Right. But I didn't want to just talk about disability right off the bat. You mm -hmm. wanted to show that there is a lot of there's life before and after and during the onset of disability and that Absolutely. disability is not all of one person's uh, mm -hmm. experience yeah. and encounter with life. You know, it's a story and it's part of your story. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to do that. I want to make sure that we, because it, 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 it has a lot of bearing on, you know, the way I live my life and, you know, of course, obviously. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to talk, the second and the third will probably get in delve more into this diaspora thing, uh, our okay. experience abroad. But I wanted to just kind of set it up with this, with mm -hmm. the stories, right. which, uh, you know, if, uh, if, if other people read the book, uh, they'll, they'll... They'll get that foundation. They'll okay, get a they'll... sense of a, you know, a foundation right. that, uh, yeah, yeah, there's life af uh, before and after Hawaii or mm -hmm. before mm -hmm. and after disability for right, in right. the stereotype <laughs> storyteller that I am, you know. So I know, so like you had your accident in high school. Do you want to tell our viewers briefly what led you to have a, a um, spinal cord injury? Do you want them to read the book? Well, they, they got to read the book. <laughs> okay, uh, but fair I, enough. Anyways, uh, I broke my neck as I fell yeah. off a rock. And uh, okay. that was after my freshman year at high school, Savior High School. So I was, I spent a year here in Hawaii. Right. And that's my, that's my introduction to Hawaii. Yeah. as an individual with a disability. When I came back again, How you know, old several were you times. I was 15 years old. 15 years old. Yeah. And did you have any family here? Was no. At that family? time, I had an uncle, but, uh, you know, he was uh, almost like, yeah, yeah. He was, there were some other relatives here. But How was your English back then and, and your understanding of American Hawaiian culture? It, it was uh, very formative, <laughs> say the least, <laughs> yes. A lot of a uh, lot of new things okay. uh, to the individual, like uh, you know, going the idea of going to the beach, and uh, you know, as all this crowd on the beach. And I remember because I, I I was hurt already at that time, so uh, they brought me and the rest of the individuals from the rehab center somewhere in wheelchairs, and uh, I and a couple of others we were on flat, laying flat on a kerney, right. and that has a huge impact on my sense of you know, who I was as a person. And I was very aware of that being there in a very negative way and in, in a very repulsive way because I just didn't understand why I was there. Mm -hmm. You know, other, you know the, the goal of the whole thing was an out, outing, you know, experience, uh, experience yeah. so, sort of kind of like to experience life. And I'm just like, this is not for me, mm -hmm. you know. So I, I totally uh, withdrew, you know, probably. Yeah. That whole thing. So. And, and so, did you feel supported and embraced and welcomed in those past uh, months or year here, or as a Micronesian man, and as an adolescent, and as uh, someone it, with I a newly acquired yeah, yeah. function? I think it was different because I was here at the hospital. Uh -huh. Yeah, I was not here in the community. So I was here as a patient and sort of tucked away in that hospital. So later on, you know, when I came back as an, you know, to go to school and to live and work, this, the, the story was different. You know, I was pretty much out in, uh, you know, out and about with, uh, 
and interacting with the community. But at that time, there weren't that many also, there weren't that many Micronesians here. So. so let's bring you to 40 years journey since you had your accident and you became quadriplegic. Um, I remember one part of your book, you mentioned that you were in such excruciating pain that you hoped that if there was going to be life, that God would take you then and there. But, mm. well, yes, he had different plans for you, and here you are. And mm. then another part of your book, it, was, it doesn't get any better than that. Mm. So, which is it in that, uh, you know, bridge between, I am really having a rough time, but uh, it doesn't get mm. better than that. Where, how do you negotiate those both? extremes part of life because that I is think you, you every, anyone who goes through that whether it's through you know disability or it's through some emotional uh, challenge or it's through social challenge I mean you do the best that you can to negotiate right. but you also have to understand that you know you are, you're dealing with a lot of forces beyond your control and mm -hmm. way and above your right. your limits as a, as, as a person and you try your best to, to deal with, uh, you know, but at the same time, you also have the sense that you're in that, in being in that situation, you're also giving yourself into, for other people to, uh, to hold, to have something from it. You know, so uh, I've always been very grateful. Before, I used to, you know, very, be very negative about it. But at some point, I think along the way, I feel that I, I'm grateful being, for being here. Yes. And, and I'm, so am I. Yeah, and so are you and, and so are, are other, uh, other individuals. So like, we tend to focus more on the pain part of it. But after the pain, then you have, you know, these moments of, you know, being alive. Well, and not only that, I mean, yeah. look at the amazing legacy that you have uh, initiated, you know, in, in your own uh, life. You've, you've moved from uh, Etal to Honolulu. You have a PhD. You have three degrees before you have your PhD. You are a servant leader. You have uh, done and continued just so much to be this bridge culturally and also as an advocate. You are one of the most resilient and gorgeous human beings that I know of and have a pleasure of calling my friend. And, you know, I, I just, you know, I am in awe of you and I hope that, you know, you come back many times and that for our viewers to get a teaser about reading the book, I will now ask you the question about where the coconut rats come from. But the story of the Kung Fu uh, cowboys, you know, I thought it was so beautiful, not having uh, electricity to be able to be exposed to American and Japanese culture through these movies that were played through a generator in a church. It's fabulous. Mm -hmm. And you know, so my last question to you is, when you go back to your center and you think about the skyscrapers and all of the electricity and the buzz of, of urban life. Do you go back, how often do you go back to Kung Fu and Cowboys and start gazing in comets in the middle of the night? <laughs> every day and every night yeah. you go. I think everybody does that too. There's always a sense of an extension uh, of a, a fantasy or a fantastic world that's beyond the huzz and bustle of uh, you know, what's in front of you and what you're dealing with. And of course, every time you get a chance to sit down, you, you must have that healthy, you know, sense of, uh, you know, um, it, just visiting those things that are, you know, sort of like in your mind that uh, it makes the world, you know, a lot more complete, that you're just not kind of dealing with, you know, the physical part of what's, what would, what's in front of you but also the the spiritual and, and you know the even the fantasy and and that's the reason why movies you know make a lot of money right. 
because we we throw ourselves into those kind of things, and not just movies. Recently, movies like uh, the Black Panthers and, uh, and Captain America and all of that stuff. Because you know, it's it's well, that uh, I, you know. I hope your book and your <laughs> other books will become a series of movies. I can't believe we are out of time. Oh, My you. life is much fuller and beautiful and more enchanted because of you being a part of it. Oh, thank you very and, much. And, uh, um, well, this concludes our episode of uh, Perspectives on Global Justice for today. Thank you so much for watching us and uh, we hope 